to, uh, well, actually, I've got a few scriptures that I'd like some people to help me with here today. Uh, Brother Craig, if you would get ready to read Revelation 4, verse 10 and 11. Brother uh, Dave, if you would get ready to read Revelation 5, 8. Brother Jim, Revelation 5, 14. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Brother Mark, if you would read Revelation 11 and verse 16. And Brother Charlie, if you would read Revelation 19 and verse 4. Thank you, Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you that we are here in your house. There's so many other places that we could choose to be today. But thank you that you put it in our hearts to come into your house. Lord, we know we cannot come before you unless you draw us. We thank you that we feel a drawing, that we feel a call. Help us to respond to your call. Wherever and however it may come, through whomever it may come, whether it come through your word, through your spirit, through a situation, through a neighbor, however the call may come, thank you for not stopping to call us, even in our ignorance, in our arrogance, in our defiance. Continue to call us and make us aware of your call. Lamb of God, I praise you that we can be in this place in freedom, freedom to express ourselves, freedom to love you, freedom to hear your word, freedom to bow down at your feet, freedom to receive from your precious hand. Lord, anoint me today to preach your word and anoint your people to receive it. Lord, may it not be just another sermon. May it not be just another meal to come to another dinner table, but may it be a life-changing experience, something, Lord God, that would provoke us, that would gouge us, that would encourage us, that would convict us to go on, Lord, and draw us closer to you. I thank you for these things, and I give you thanks and praise, glory and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Uh, Brother Craig, if you'd read the first one. I want you to take note of the verses we're reading. Revelation 4, verse 10 and 11, correct? Yes. Um, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And worship, worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay. Revelations 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. All right, Brother Jim. Revelation 5.14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Brother Mark. <clears throat> Revelation eleven sixteen. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Read the next verse as well. Saying, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great powers and hast reigned. 
Amen. Brother Charlie. Revelation 19, verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen and hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. What did all these verses have in common? They all fell down. Do you realize the center stage that these beasts and elders take in the heavenly throne room? All the way through here, we just read in the book of Revelation, we see the beasts and the elders around about the throne of God falling down. Now, we're not just talking about bowing down. We're talking about falling down. Praise the name of Jesus. Blessed be the Lord. We've been talking here recently, these last weeks since summit, about the beasts and the elders, the kings and the priests, and how that somewhere along the way in our journey, we missed a step. And I can't speak for anybody but me. Here I'm trying to reach for some height, and it's like I can't get it, I can't attain it. I've struggled, I've strived, I've pushed, I've prayed, I've warred, and it's like it's still, I, I'm, I'm at Mount Sinai, as it were, still standing afar off. And I started to ask the Lord, why? Why is it that I'm still not there. Why is it that after 40 years, Amen. hallelujah, walking in the wilderness, I just had a revelation. <laughs> Glory to God, hallelujah. And the Lord uh, uh, spoke to me a few months ago and said, you've missed a step. And I didn't know what that meant. What do you mean I've missed a step? Where, where have I gone wrong? Where, where did I miss a step? Where did I jump over an experience that I needed to have in my being to be able to get in the throne. Mm. And that's when the Lord took me to the beasts and the elders, to the kings and the priests, to the ones, glory to God, in the book of Revelation, he said to the last day church age, he said to them, uh, go and buy gold that is tried in the furnace, and go and buy white raiment. And it didn't make sense to me. Why raiment? Why white raiment? Why not in this last moment? Why not white linen? Why was the focus in Laodicea on the raiment? Ah, And the white raiment is the garment, it is the the clothing of the kings and the priests who are the beasts and the elders that fall down before the throne on a perpetual basis in the heavenly throne room of God. They are the heavenly worshipers. They are the kings and the priests that are always falling down and casting their crowns, which is another lesson I want to teach on. Glory be to God. And saying, you are worthy. You are worthy. They sing a song unto the Lamb because they've had a revelation of the Lamb, the redemption of the Lamb, what the Lamb has done for them, what the Lamb has conquered for them, where the Lamb has brought them. Hallelujah. And the Lord spoke so powerfully to me that day and said, you're wanting to get into my throne, but you're not willing to bow before it. And I started to think about it. Wait a minute. Is this the step I've missed? And all this time I'm reaching and reaching for something up there and trying to jump over a major experience in my life. Trying to jump over bowing because I want to be in. 
Try to jump over yielding because I want to be part of something there that I cannot be part of until I learn to fall down. Fall down in absolute, utter, total surrender before God. In worship and adoration and love, telling Him who He is, not because I know a theory in my head, but because I have an experience with Him. The beasts and the elders experienced God and the Lamb in such a way it drove them down on their knees. It drove them to cast their crowns. It drove them to say, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Hallelujah. And you are the only one who is worthy because you have created all things. And for your pleasure, they are and they were created. Everything is about you. It's all for you, from you, to you, through you, of you. And so I came to realize that somewhere along my journey, I had missed an experience that I know I needed to go back and purchase some raiment. And then he said, if you overcome in this place, saying to the Laodicea, I will bring you to sit with me in my throne as I am seated with my father in his throne. Thank you, Lord. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about these beasts and these elders and the experience that they had and bringing that experience into, God willing, into our our own Lives. I want you to turn with me to Revelation 11 again. Praise you, Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I don't want to miss Him. I want to be all He's called me to be. I want to uh, uh, reach a, the destiny that He has called me to reach. Thank you, Lord, uh, here in time and certainly for eternity. I'm in Revelation. Are you there with me? I'm in chapter 11, and again reading, uh, this is at the end of the opening of the seventh seal. Oh boy, that's powerful stuff. Anyway, let me not go there. In verse 16, and the four and the twenty elders which sat before God on their seats or on their thrones... These were kings. These were guys who who had grown in authority. They had matured. An elder is someone who has matured. We've been talking about maturity in the course of of studying all this. And and I have believed in and I have embraced, uh, uh, praise God, the principles of growing in God and, and becoming mature only to realize one day that I just wasn't as mature as I thought I was. I did a lot of uh, mental gymnastics in my mind, but I failed to understand the simplicity of maturity. Maturity, spiritual maturity, is pursuing the character and the nature of Jesus. That's pretty simple. Hallelujah. And I'd done a lot of things, but not matured. And I realized there too was a step that I'd missed. I thought I had it because I had it in my mind. See, you can know something in your head. It doesn't mean it's yours. It doesn't mean it is your experience. Praise God. So this is why I believe uh, God is, uh, for me, I cannot speak for you, but I'm sharing my heart where I am, and maybe you're following with me. If you are, just get on right behind and let's go for it. But if I feel like God has rewound a tape for me. That's how it sounds. And I've gone back to this place of raiment. I've gone back to this place of, of falling down. 
Kabasaya, before the throne of God. I'm not talking about, you see, the word worship means to bow down. And I'm not talking about having a nice worship 40, 50 minute session in church. I'm not talking about nice music, good songs, great voices. <laughs> and pride. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living a life of bowing. Bowing when things are contrary. Hallelujah. True, listen to me. True, living, fiery worship is born in the midst of conflict. Say, oh, somebody shout. When, when things are conflicting your way, your will, your desire, your feelings, your wants, your vision. When things are conflicting that, that's the time to worship. That's when true worship is born. Hallelujah. That's when bowing down becomes real. We can bow down. Oh, I just got a raise. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It was a long lost uncle. I didn't even know about it. He left me a million dollars. <laughs> then it's easy to bow down. The true worship is born out of a conflict. When something is resisting you, pushing you, gouging you, going against the grain of your own wish and desire, can we then bow? Can we then fall and say, you're worthy. You've created everything for you, not for me. You've done it all for your own name's sake. It's for your pleasure. It's for your rot zone. It's for your purpose. It's for your will, not for mine. You are worthy, O oh Lord. This is when true worship is born and becomes a reality in our lives. Can we worship then? Have we missed a step? I know all too many people, including one I see in the mirror, who only too often has felt the obstinance, the resistance, the pride, the arrogance, the standing up when things go contrary to me. Hallelujah. But you see, I want to buy that gold. And I want to buy that raiment. Hey! I wish somebody would shout in here today. Thank you, Lord. Because I hunger to go and live and abide in the personal presence of God, which where we're going in His Word today. Revelation 11, and the four and the twenty elders which sat before God on their thrones, on their seats, they didn't just fall. It says they fell on their faces and worshipped God saying, we give thee thanks. The word fall has two different meanings. The word fall means to fall uncontrollably where you did not control the fall. Now you, you all know you've tripped at some point in time or something is, has happened where you have fallen involuntarily. Spiritually, 
we can fall involuntarily when the hand of God comes down heavy upon you. We were in a service here during the summit where the presence of God was so powerful. Even that 86-year-old sister was laying on the floor because you could not stand. There was a power and a presence that involuntarily just pushed you down. Thank you, Lord. So there's that side of it where just like with Ezekiel, Ezekiel said when he was by the river Chabar and he had that incredible vision in Babylon and he said, and the hand of the Lord fell upon me. That experience, when his hand falls on you and causes you to fall before him, this is involuntary falling. But the word fall also means an act of the will. To fall deliberately. And praise God, when everything doesn't feel like it. When the flesh is saying no. When everything is in resistance. When the pain seems too great. When you are hated, misunderstood, reviled, pushed aside, rejected, persecuted or something's not quite going your way and you say I am going to bow I am going to fall before the almighty God because he's worthy I don't hear anybody hallelujah what a wonderful experience that is. So, I'm not just talking about bowing. I'm talking about falling on the face. Why does it say that? <laughs> Do you know Abraham fell on his face? Moses fell on his face. Joshua fell on his face. Gideon fell on his face. Woo! Ruth fell on her face. David fell on his face. Ezekiel fell on his face. Glory be to God. All the disciples fell on their face. Jesus himself in the garden of Gethsemane fell on his face. Somebody praise the living God. Hallelujah. Jehoshaphat fell on his face. The four beasts fell on their face. The four creatures of the 24 elders fell on their face. All the angels round about the throne of God fell on their face. Why the face? From Genesis through the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22 is the last time you see the example of ones falling on their face before God. Why? The word face is ponim. Ponim means countenance. It means the self. It means presence. Do you know that last year, globally, 265 billion dollars were spent on facial cosmetics. 265 billion. The face is the first thing you behold on a person. 
The face tells your story. The face is your book. The face has expression. You can read a person by looking at their face. The face holds all of your five senses. Sight, taste, smell, hearing, and you can feel and touch. It's all here in the face. Eighteen billion dollars alone were spent in the United States of America on facial plastic surgery. Eighteen billion. This is how much people care about the face. Because the face is your recognition. The face is how you are known. If you took your, covered your face, people might be able to guess who you were. But if I guarantee you put just a, a robe on you and covered your face, nobody would know who you are. The face is your recognition. Hallelujah. Face, ponim, is the word that is used every time the presence of God is mentioned. The presence of God comes to us through his face. Lift up your countenance upon thee. Let your presence be upon us. When a person walks in your home or into the church, you can take one look at them. <laughs> Maybe you don't do that, but I do. And you can tell what they've been going through even that morning before they came to church. Conflict in the family, an argument, something went wrong. Or you can tell if they got victory, joy, and life. It's all in the face. The face brings your presence. Hallelujah. God's face defines his presence. All these people fell on their face before the living God. In other words, they were saying, the word ponim also means honor. I bow myself. I bow my honor. I bow my recognition. I bow my own presence to be engulfed in yours. Hey, said Ahaya. I wish somebody would just say, Shine, you Mandahaya. You always know when someone's been bowing. When someone has been bowing their face before God and hiding themselves in the presence of the Lord, in the face of the Lord, you can always tell on their face. There is a glow upon those who fall on their face before God. There is a shine, there is a victory that comes with their presence. They walk into a room and they bring presence with them, not their own, but his. Because they have laid their presence hey! down to They have laid their presence down to be hid in his. In other words, I don't want to be recognized. I don't want to be seen. I'm not the one projecting my person, myself. I want to project him. Thank you, Lord. So falling on all, look, let me ask you a question. Since all of these people that I mentioned, and many, many more, all throughout the Word of God, Old and New Testament, past and still yet future, fall on their face before God, what makes us think that this is not part of our 
reality. That this is not something God requires of us. That God is not asking us, look, just stop looking over yonder there for a while and look at my feet. Just get down and bow yourself, your recognition, your honor in my presence. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. There is absolutely no coincidence why Facebook is called Facebook. And if God's people spent as much time at the table of faces, at the bread of faces, and eating from the bread of faces as they do on Facebook, we might have a revival. Somebody's got to praise the Lord. Hey, shut up, Bahia. Facebook is all about people's face. It's put it out there. It's put out there what I do, what I eat, where I go, how I sleep, what I drink, who's my friends. All fake friends, by the way. Fake. It's all fake. There's no reality in it. I'm not telling you to go home and get off Facebook. Personally, I don't care what anybody is. Seven Pillars Church got a Facebook. We have a Facebook page. But you won't catch me sitting on Facebook trying to discover something about somebody else's existence. It has changed society. It has changed the way we live. Facebook has changed the way people interact with each other. It's no longer personal. It's garbage. It's gossip. Stories get started. Things get spread. And you get connected with people you don't even know. Up comes their face. So my church may be smaller next Sunday. (laughs) I hate to say, actually I don't hate it, but it's the truth. The controller of Facebook is demonic. It is demonic in nature. It is not natural. It is not the natural way for human beings to interact with each other. It is false. It's not real. But it's all about this. I want to project my honor, myself, what I have accomplished, where I am going, my vacation, my this, my, it's all me. And I want everybody to see. Let's see how many friends I can get because the more friends I can get, the more I can influence with my face. And God says, I have a table prepared in the midst of your enemies. And on that table, there is the bread of presence. There is the bread of faces. My presence is on that table. And if you would just fight through, fight through the world, fight fight through your flesh, Fight through the opposition and the obstacles that are resisting you and standing in your way. And get a hold of the bread of faces. I will satisfy your longing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm talking about falling. I'm talking about falling on your face. Bowing down before God, your honor, your recognition, your presence, your self, self, and hiding it in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Blessed be his wonderful name. I don't know about you, 
that I know about me. And this one thing I can say about me, I've not done enough of this. I've not done enough of this. I've stood up when the war gets going and the fight gets tough. And the opposition seems to be unending and the pain of it and the rejection and the hate that one feels dots coming from all directions, literally, hallelujah, with words and attitudes and oh, how you want to just rise up and get on Facebook and let's put out the truth even if we have to fabricate it a little bit. Hallelujah. And God says, that's not the way to hide in me. The way to hide in me is to bow your face. Hide, Ohio! I'll pray. Somebody blesses. Hey, son of high. Reach down to Moshuya. It's to bow, fall down with your face to the ground at my feet where you, where you are enshrouded with my presence. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if I'm making any sense today. Hallelujah. This is supposed to be a Thanksgiving message. It's okay. Uh, Thanksgiving is every day. So if we got to go to Thanksgiving next month, I don't care. Because every day should be Thanksgiving. Go to Genesis chapter 17. Actually, true thanksgiving is born in worship when you're falling down prostrate before the Lord. That is thanksgiving. Uh, I'm in Genesis chapter 17, verse, verses 1 to 3. When Abram was 90 years old and nine... The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, be entire, be truthful, be complete. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram Talk to me. What did he do? And God talked with him. Okay, remember that. Go to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. And I'm reading verse 14 and 15. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. This was now Christ appearing in angelic form. He is the captain of the Lord's host. As the captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua, say it. What did he do? Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Go to Ezekiel chapter 1. This is Ezekiel's famous experience by the river Chabar. The word Chabar means to, to uh, lengthen, to make long. Have you ever felt like, you know, God's purpose, God's promise, God's fulfillment in your life is just taking a long time? You're sitting by Chabar. <laughs> You're drinking from Chabar. That's what Chabar means. And things just become... 
drawn out and long. Are we always going to be in Babylon? Are we always going to sit by this filthy river? Are we always going to be under the bondage of the Babylonians? It was, a, and it was there in that experience. L- listen to me now. I don't care where you are. God will talk to you if you learn to fall down. They, he was not in Zion. Ezekiel was not in the temple in Jerusalem. He was in Babylon. He was in the midst of confusion. He was in the place of Akabosata. Oh, somebody praise God. Glory to God. I'm sure he didn't understand a lot of things. But it was in that place where God came down heavily upon him and gave him this incredible vision and spoke to him. Hallelujah. And this is what it says in, uh, uh, what did I say? Did I give you a verse? Well, let me figure that out first. 28. This is part of the vision. And the appearance of the bow that is in, in the cloud, whoo, in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about, talking about the vision of the throne and the presence of God. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory, the abode of the Lord. And when I saw it, I... Say it. Say it one more time. And when he fell upon his face, I heard a voice of one that spake to me. 2 verse 1, And he said to me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. To thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him speak unto me. If you and I would only learn to fall down on our face, praise God, and hide ourselves, hide our recognition, hide our honor, hide our presence, I, in the presence of the Almighty God, God will talk to you. And when God talks to you, He will raise you up. He will stand you on your feet. Praise God. Shakata. For you to be able to fulfill what He is purposing, has purposed for you to fulfill. But it begins before arising. And being able to get into the fence and get to the purpose. Number one, fall down. Hallelujah. In recognition and honor to who God is. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter who I am. Doesn't matter what we have and do not have. Doesn't matter how many or how few. It doesn't matter the, the, the trials. It doesn't matter the opposition. It doesn't matter the hate and the resistance. What does matter is are we willing to fall down? Are we willing to acknowledge who God is? Are we willing to put our own face, our own presence, our shakata? I wish somebody would help me here today. How much do we want what we say we want. I have my eye on a prize. There's a destiny before me. It's eternal. It was put in me by my father in eternity past when he spoke his eternal name over me. So it was also with you. Hallelujah. That purpose will not be thwarted. It will not be, it will, might be hindered, but it will not be thwarted. If only I learn to say, God, okay, 
that's not going to influence me. Neither is that. Neither is he. Neither is she. Neither are they. What matters to me is putting my eyes on your throne, on your presence, and bow to that presence. We want to be great. But we don't want to be small. We want to go in. But something in us just, just, just doesn't want to bow. And when you still feel that resistance, you know you haven't gotten there yet. Or at least you have not overcome. In this place where God's saying, buy the gold now. Go get the raiment. And, and start overcoming in this place. Because if you do, I'm going to call you into my throne. But first... Before you put on the linen there, you need to go get some raiment. There's some overcoming to do that has to do with bowing or falling on your face before God. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Go to Psalm 31. Psalm chapter 31. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Every one of these people I uh, read to you, uh, Abram and Joshua and Ezekiel, when they fell on their face, God spoke to them. Have you wondered why you're not hearing If you stop to ponder, I've been seeking and seeking and asking about this and that for years maybe. Why am I not hearing? Why is there no response? Why is there no answer? Take inventory today of your position before God. Is it upright? Is it defiant? Is it arrogant? Is it demanding? Is it spiteful? Or is it bowed? Because my Bible tells me if I bow, if I fall on my face, and I'm not so interested in my projection, in myself, but I'm more interested in his presence on me, around me, and in me. He said, if I can see that in you, and I can feel that in you, I will talk to you. I will talk to you. I will open my mouth, and I'll say, this is my will. This is my way. This is my purpose. People wander around life aimlessly for years and years and years. Oh, I've been asking about God about that forever and a day. He just don't tell me anything. He talks to everybody else, but he doesn't talk to me. And he's probably standing there or sitting there, whatever position he has, waiting. I so badly want to talk to you, but I can't talk to you while you're upright because you'll run. I can only talk to you when you're surrendered. I can only talk to you when you're bowed down. This is why it says in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, discern, know, understand, what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God? So in other words, before you can discern and know and understand, this has got to be the sacrifice. The giving of, the, of oneself must come first. Then comes the, the discerning of the will of God. But we reverse it. Well, tell me your will, God, and then I'll decide if I'm going to do it or not. 
And God said, no, bow first. I want to see you bow, not because of anything I've said or done, but because of who I am. Because I'm God. Because I'm worthy. Oh, come on, praise the Lord. Come on, if you feel the need to bow down, go ahead and bow. Come on, saints, if you feel the burden to bow, bow before him right now. Bow before the Lord. Call upon his name. Call upon his name. We had a bashalad of us all. Come on, saints, call upon him. Don't be afraid, let it go.